Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing that the Israelites ever made it to the promised land. There was so much grumbling going on throughout the whole journey. Not only in our passage today, but throughout the whole journey. They leave Egypt and get to the Red Sea, and the people feel trapped. Pharaoh's army is catching up, and the people complain to Moses and ask him if they were brought out into the wilderness to die. But then God provides a way. He parts the Red Sea so that the Israelites can go through, but Pharaoh's army can't. Then about 40 days later, when the Israelites get to the promised land, they doubt they can claim the land as they believe they are grasshoppers among giants. They think it's impossible with their size to claim the land. So God punishes their whining and unbelief by not letting them enter the promised land for another 40 years. Then as the Israelites are in the beginnings of traveling in their wilderness in those 40 years, they are complaining about food. They're complaining about not only having manna to eat, about only having manna to eat. Bread. They wish they had meat to eat. Like how they had many other different kinds of food that they used to eat in Egypt. And so again, Moses asked God if he brought them out in the wilderness to die. Now, what would you do if you were Moses in this case? Would you say to the Israelites who are complaining, you are right. The food was great as we lived as a slave in Egypt. We should probably go back. Or would you say, I've had it with your whining. Go drown your sorrows in some manna. Or would you say something else entirely? Maybe you might be a little more empathetic and say, I see you're tired of having the same food over and over. And yes, there was a variety of food back in Egypt, but after a little bit of simple living, God will lead us to a promised land that is greater than we can ever imagine. Well, did you notice how God responded to the Israelites whining? As God would lead the Israelites by a pillar of cloud by day and by a pillar of fire by night, the fire God presented himself with at night became more intensified. In other words, the complaining of the Israelites bothered God. And Moses responded by praying to God in behalf of the Israelites. Now, I'm not sure if you would say Moses was whining in his prayer or if he was just desperate for help. But there seems to be a pattern in Moses' prayers when you read his prayers in the Scriptures. At this moment in the book of Numbers, Moses presents to God that he, the Lord God, has brought Moses out into the wilderness to die, and that leading the Israelites is too much of a responsibility for him. And if you finish the book of Numbers, you will find out that Moses did not get to go to the promised land. God said he would 
God told him that he would die just before they get there because of his lack of faithfulness. A moment mentioned later in the book of Numbers. Joshua would be the next leader that would complete the plan. Now, how many of you know that being a leader has its challenges? I've heard it once said, wouldn't it be great if you just tell people what they do and they just do it? Now, if you've ever been a parent, you know that probably just doesn't work. There's some oversight and grace that goes along with leadership. And speaking of parents, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, suggested to Moses earlier that he should extend his leadership to others. As what is written in Exodus chapter 18, Jethro said, What are you doing? What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which we must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe. I place such men over the people's chief, over the people as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but no small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you that they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you'll be able to endure, and all these people will also go to their place in peace. Well, this seems to be the advice that God gives to Moses. And the Lord says, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. Then God provides a process of how this will happen. First, they go through the process of making themselves holy. And then God extends some of the leadership spirit of Moses and shares it with 70 of the elders. No, Moses did not give up some of his authority. Rather, he extended it. The elders also had the strength and the authority to lead. And with this authority, they were able to prophesy. They were given the strength to give praises to God and instruct God's people with God's law. Now, how many people were under Moses' care? Well, Moses himself says 600,000 people. Over a half a million people to govern is a lot. But Moses doesn't have to do it alone. Moses was given the freedom to extend his responsibility to others so that everyone can take part in receiving help from God and receive God's blessings. And God doesn't seem to have a shortage of anything. After reading the scripture, I kind of wonder why the Israelites or Moses just didn't ask for meat from
from God politely. Did they already do that and God didn't give them an answer? We don't seem to get that impression when we look at the story of Moses. But maybe perhaps Moses should have read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yes, of course, that was a joke. But God still chose Moses to lead the Israelites to the promised land. And yet, the people still got there. God was present with the Israelites throughout the whole journey. And God answered their prayer. Especially in this case with God providing quail for the Israelites to eat. An abundance of quail. And God gives us, the church, the tools to meet the needs of the people. He gives us church pastors to pray in behalf of the people, to guide them in praying well, and teaching them how to pray, and giving them a connection to God. He gives the church the practice of confession and repentance, to acknowledge to God that to God and to others that they have made mistakes and that God forgives them and that they can come to God and with others so that in the end they can be considered clean, to be considered worthy by others, to be worthy of respect. And God gives us people to teach others about what God desires from us, to prophesy or teach or, or preach what is good and where we should repent, where we should turn from our ways of living. And God gives people the authority to lead the church and discipline the church when people do wrong. The organization of the church is God's gift for us. Not to make us more busy, but to make us spiritually healthy so that we may live well. The tools of the church are not to be a burden. The people can remove the church from their lives, but if they think the church is a burden for them, then how will the people deal with their hurts and the bad character that they have to deal with in their life? If they don't have a practice to deal with it all. The people in the wilderness, they needed someone to rescue them. They needed a savior. God helped and rescued his people time and time again because he loved them. He knew they were a broken people who couldn't save themselves. They couldn't get through the wilderness without whining. And all people are broken and can't save themselves. But that doesn't mean that God excuses their behavior. He promised that he would send them a savior and would provide a good future for them. Then one day that future, that promise finally came. And of course, his name is Jesus. Jesus rescued his people by going through his God-given journey, by doing what God asked him to do. And he did it all for us. Though Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, my father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. 
Jesus knew he was going to have to go through suffering. And he chose to go along on the journey anyways. He knew there was going to be pain and suffering when he was hanging on the cross. But he knew this was also the answer to all our pain and suffering. It was the answer to all our complaining and grumbling. Jesus was perfect for us, and even though he had no reason to die, because he did not do any wrong. But innocent Jesus died a death declared guilty so that our punishment for sin, the sin that makes God upset, will be paid for through Jesus' death. And Jesus' innocence becomes our innocence. And God comes to us on the day of judgment, looking at Jesus' innocence and not our sin. As we are saved by what God has done for us, let us not take for granted the tools and the gifts that God has given us. Not only for the sake of having strong faith in God, but also for having a good relationship with others around us. That they too may benefit from God's blessings. And that we now they too may not grumble about what God has given us. Also, let us pray boldly and faithful that the church will continue to be a place of spiritual care. That the people in our town will find ways to receive this God-given care. That all people will finish their life on earth, holding on to God's gracious and eternal promises. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we now collect our offerings.